Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 21, Rapid Fire. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions, and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of the feedback we've received, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. So some feedback on our talk about getting your kids to game and kid game recommendations. Samantha Bryant wrote on MeWe, it wasn't hard to get our girls gaming with us. Games are kind of inherently appealing to their interesting, sorry, appealing with their interesting fiddly bits and the promise of a good time. The trickiest part for us was finding games the children could play that will still engage the adults. Now, this is not a problem now that they are 11 and 18, but when they were munchkins who couldn't read or math well yet, it was harder. As pre-readers, they both loved Hey, That's My Fish, Dixit, Dweebies, which are charming and interesting for the adults too. We also played a fair number of co-op games, like Forbidden Island, Flashpoint. Those were nice because since we are all working together anyway, we could fill their knowledge gaps without hurting their feelings. Channel A became fun once they could read. Now we're fortunate to have two very game-loving daughters to share our lives with. I think that's great to hear how you've bonded with your family over games like that. Now, Conrad Evanshire, also on MeWe, writes, Great article, Mo. A couple of years ago, I was looking to try RPGs with my kids, now 6, 9, and 11. I stumbled upon Hero Kids. My kids love it. Particularly enjoy seeing them cooperate and solve puzzles and encounters in creative ways. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, I've been tempted to check out Hero, Cli uh, sorry, Hero Kids. Um, it's, I remember seeing it many times online and seeing people talk about it. Though right now we already had Mermaid Adventures. Another one I keep seeing is from uh, Monty Cook Games, which is No Thank You Evil. Now, if I could put on my tabletop gaming deals hat for just a moment, there is a great deal going on right now at Drive Through RPG. They're calling it the Teach Your Kids to Game event. And the little hashtag or the, the subtext is, what better gift to give your kids than the gift of gaming? Now, if you're watching us stream live, you can scroll down a bit to our widgets and you should see a Drive Through RPG link. If you were thinking of taking advantage of this deal, it would be awesome if you clicked on that to get through to Drive Through RPG. For those of you watching on YouTube or listening at home, check out the show notes for a link directly to that deal, but be aware it might not still be as great a deal depending on when you're listening to this. Yeah, it is going till I think December 25th. I think it's going right till Christmas. So if you're listening when the episode comes out, you should still have some time. So up next, I want to share some excerpts from a conversation I had with Andrew Dacey on the Misdirected Mark Slack channel. So first off, the conversation started by him saying, I'm really liking the show. Seems like Sean's audio quality has gotten better and the format really works. We went back and forth for a bit and then he followed up with something that uh, I loved hearing. If I find a podcast I want to try out, I download the entire back catalog and start at the beginning. And then the best part. What I'm liking about the show is the honest feedback on what expansions are worth it and which should be avoided. Also adding in the context. Like you never trash something, but if you don't like a certain game or expansion, you provide enough information about why so that the listener can be informed enough about whether they feel the same way. Like if you say you don't like an expansion because it really ramps up the random element, I could see how a listener might want to go pick up that expansion based on the comment if they wanted more randomness in their game. Well, thanks, Andrew. We try to work on our to our strengths here. I let Mo focus on the blogging and the gaming while I try to work and make sure we've got, we're delivering the content that he produces in engaging and entertaining ways. I'm a bit embarrassed by the quality of some of our earlier productions if you are going back there, but because the content is so great, we aren't planning on taking it away. I'm just trying to strive to make each episode we produce better in some way. So we really do have to replace our episode zero. That one's garbage. We just have not had time to swap it up. Plus some of the stuff we say in there is no longer true. 
So overall, though, I really appreciate these comments. Uh, it's awesome to know that people dig our format and the way I've been talking about games. I admit I don't like to bash games and generally prefer to talk about what I love. But if a game does come up or if someone asks me a question about a game, I'm going to give my honest opinion. And it's rewarding to know that people are finding this advice useful. Except Candyland. We bash Candyland because it's not a game as we have discussed. <laughs> well, that's it for feedback this week. Thanks to everyone who took the time to email, reply, and comment on social media. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops Tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. So the big thing that happened this past week is I finally, we finally got to play Gloomhaven again. With event schedules, holidays, sickness, it's been a while since we've heard from our somewhat successful adventurers. <laughs> it's good to hear the game is engaging enough to bring everyone back even after a longer hiatus. Yeah, it was longer than we thought. We sat down with Tori and Kat and we're like, how long has it been? And I'm like, I swear it's been a month. And then Tori's like, nah, it's only been a couple weeks. And Kat's no, thinking, no. man, it's been like two months. So, of course, again, I went to Board Game Geek, looked up when our last play was logged, and it was a month plus a day since the last time we had played. So a full month had gone by. Yeah, because uh, this was... I remember, we intention. remember talking about you cleaning it up and, and putting it off the table finally, yes. and it, that was quite a while ago. Yeah, like we left it up for two weeks, so I knew it was at least two weeks. And then we cleaned it up for something. We had people coming over, there was a party or something. I don't remember what now. Oh, Extra Life. We had to clean up for Extra Life. Yeah. So there, yeah, that's how long ago it was. So this time we were trying a mission a second time. So we were playing the mission, the Windswept Highlands. It's number, I think, 72 or something like that. Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil much except to talk about the difficulty of it. I'm not going to give away anything that's in the mission. Plus, I'm still not even sure in Gloomy. I mean, here's, here's one of the questions we came up. How much are you supposed to know? Like, you've got the scenario book. Are you allowed to flip ahead and read or not? Because it's not like a real legacy game where you're unlocking stuff. It's all there. But anyway, side note, I'm not going to spoil anything that's not in the book. Plus, I'm not even going to talk about some of the stuff in the book because maybe people don't want to read ahead. So I don't know if you remember a month ago, but we got destroyed. Like, it was terrible. It was not even close. I wouldn't even say we got halfway to completing the mission. It was bad. Well, we've talked before about the balance in this game and how, in hindsight, four players isn't the wisest choice. That's not how the yeah, game plays best. Not. Yeah, it plays best at three, which, think, like, you figure... RPGs are just four-person party, right? You should have your wizard, your thief, your fighter, your mage. Is that what I'm missing? I don't know what I missed there. Uh, priest. The priest. There you go, cleric. cleric. Not that you have those classes in Gloomhaven. Gloom, I, I've mentioned it before. It's one of the things, big props to Gloomhaven for not just taking all the D&D tropes and all the token tropes. But anyway, four-person party is kind of the standard thing. It's, it's slightly disappointing that they don't follow that trend. But anyway, so... Knowing how hard it was last time and how bad we did, we decided to prepare. So this is going to showcase some of the cool stuff about Gloomhaven, the fact we were able to do this. So we left the Windswept Highlands and we went back to Gloomhaven, which is the big town. When we got back to Gloomhaven, we got to do a city adventure. I'll admit we did that a month ago and I don't quite remember what happened. We did something and it was positive, whatever the outcome was, it was okay. Um, but it also let us shop and do some other things in town. Now, there's not a lot to do in town. Like, this is no RPG. This isn't, you're, you're not role-playing an encounter at the end. You're not going to get into a bar fight unless that card you draw when you're in the city happens to say you do. It's more like if anyone played the old Mordheim game where you kind of go back to town, you can have a couple things happen and you leave. So it is cool that there is a town phase, though, like in between your adventures. And you choose. You could, like, we didn't have to go back. We could have went somewhere else. Or we could have stayed where we were and just encountered. It's, it's optional to go back to town. But we wanted to do it because, well, we failed that. So, and we had some money. So everyone took advantage of going back to town. I personally bought some armor and went to the church and got blessed. Everyone else did similar things, though I couldn't tell you exactly what they bought or what they did. My, my thought first goes to uh, Bard's Tale, for those of us old enough to remember that jam. Yeah. Just going back to town for shops and a couple activities and really no encounters, per se. Yeah. Or, or uh, an even better example might be uh, Town Portal in Diablo. Yep, there you go. Yep. Yeah, I'm full of equipment. Time to go back there. I have lots of money. Town to Town Portal. Of course, in this, you got to get back, which I'll get to right now. Because once you leave town, 
this is when stuff happens. Whenever you travel on the overland map, an event happens. Now, these are not usually good things. The town stuff tends to be things that improve or help your party or help the town or do some good things. And they tell you this in the book. Again, I'm not spoiling anything. The town encounters tend to be positive, and the overland encounters are mixed and can be negative. We did something that wasn't too great overall. Um, it was good for Gloomhaven, so our prosperity went up one, but we pissed someone off and they cursed us. So that undid some of what we got done in town. So now does the cursing, a, someone who's blessed, end up neutral or you end up cursed, cursed uh, completely offsetting and more the uh, blessing? I, it's, it's neither in a way. So when you get blessed, you get two blessed cards that go into your deck. So instead of having like a D20 to roll to hit, you have a 20 card deck and it they're all the same when you start the game and they have plus one or plus ones, minus ones, zeros, plus twos, minus twos, one times two and one miss in the entire deck. And the distributions like there aren't as many plus twos as there are plus ones. And I couldn't tell you the exact numbers, but there's 20 cards. When you get a bless, you get two times two cards to add to that deck. So it's a better chance you're going to draw times two damage. When you get cursed, you get another miss card in your deck. So in this case, getting blessed gave me two times two damage. Getting cursed gave me one curse. So overall, I'm still up. But then again, it's a random deck, so I may not have drawn any of these, or I could have drawn all of them. Right. So as for our prep work, it worked barely. Like, like I barely, barely, barely. Like, as close as possible. Skin of the teeth. Like, we won on the last possible turn. The last possible move. We had exhausted characters, which is the Gloobhaven equipment of your PC's dead. Like, there's no resurrected. You're just exhausted, and you can come back next time. Like, we're, we're, we're toast. It was literally down to one card, and it was my choice. I uh, had a choice of trying to complete my personal goal or win the mission. And I have to admit, I'd earned a ton of XP. Because you get XP by using your cards, and you get the XP whether you complete the mission or not. Like, almost enough to level up. And I got to admit, I was really tempted to push my luck to try to get my personal goal too because that would have given me three check marks which let me get a perk basically like a small level up like getting a feat in dnd and i was tempted but you know uh i don't know i'm like i could play this or i could complete the goal and possibly complete the goal and win or just win well you know not unlike a real rpg there are, are hard choices that impact character development and party play uh but the other yeah. thing is uh now you're back at easy now correct yeah, that's correct. So we did swap back. So that did make a bit of a difference. Actually, I think quite a bit of a difference. Now, looking back at that night, I don't think there was any way. Like, had I not given up on the goal, we would have lost. And I wouldn't have got the check mark because you have to complete the mission to get your goals. Now, the goals are cool because what the goals do is they add a bit of PvP, right? Like, they, they put choices like that in the game. I remember our first time we played and lost... Um, one of the reasons was I had a goal that was you have to open every door yourself. So my character just charged ahead and burst through every room in hopes of getting these two check marks, which was horrible for the rest of the party. And I know there was at least one mission where Tori were like, what are you doing? And he kept hanging in the back. Well, it's because he had a per personal goal to loot a bunch of money. Now, these are all hidden, right? So, And they're not terrible. Like, they're not screw the party. They're do a couple things to help yourself that may make things a little harder for everyone else. It's pretty neat. It's interesting that, uh, you know, it really is that, that whole balance between uh, solo and team. And I wonder if that's some of the reason why people really uh, talk, uh, say, wonders about the solitaire aspect of this game. Yeah, it's true. I, in a way, you th I think you'd be losing something, but you definitely wouldn't have to deal with that. So I would think if you are a, a gamer who wants to win, it's probably better solo, not dealing with that. But if you want an RPG experience in a board game, I'd much rather have that little bit of party tension, right? It adds in that whole thief stealing from the party and the whole ranger's folly, right? The character who leads off ahead to hopefully find the magic item. Like, you get those experiences in a board game now. But it, I think a lot of people don't necessarily want that from a board game. You get a lot of people yeah. who are who are ga who are board gamers and not RPG players uh, right. who might be looking for that, uh, you know, the way to win rather than the way to mm -hmm. play it out. Yeah, very true. 
So this was our best Gloomhaven experience yet, at least to me. I think so. I think everyone else did. Like, we were whooping, cheering. I, or There were high fives. Like, we had a huge feeling of accomplishment finishing this mission, especially with how close it was. And it's tough. Like, it is a hard, hard mission. Um, there is an added puzzle aspect to the rest of the play. So having to manage your cards and move around the map and doing things, this particular mission has an added puzzle element that, again, I don't want to spoil, but it's neat. Like, I think it may be one of the better scenarios in the book. But, like, this was so bad that partway through, I fear we're doomed. Like, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I don't see how we could win. And it ends up that I had screwed up and put some cards in the wrong spot, like personal mistake. Uh, cheating fairly, as we called it. And then I realized that I had discarded cards that I, or I, I had lost cards I should have discarded. So I'm like, oh, wait, maybe we can make it. But at that point, I was starting to Google it. The, is this mission impossible? Because one of the things that's interesting is this particular mission was added through Kickstarter. So the game designer, Isaac Childress, did not design this. The normal scenario designer did not design this mission. This was one of the extra quests that was added as a Kickstarter backer reward. And I was starting to really question that maybe whoever invented this is not the game designer and made some mistakes. So what I found when I Googled it was lots and lots of people saying it's impossible to player. And then a whole bunch of other people just bragging that they beat it on the first try. And I didn't see anything about problems at four player. So I'm like, I don't know. There's a lot of people complaining about this. So either way, we beat it. Like, I really didn't think we were. And if we had failed, we would have went somewhere else. I'd be like, I give up. I'm not, we're not trying Windswept Highlands again. We'll come back at level 20 or whatever the max level is. Try it again. Like, we felt so good that there's an envelope. This, this is a small spoiler, but you're going to figure it out eventually. There's an envelope hidden somewhere in the box that says, open this when you feel like you deserve it. Well, we opened that because we felt like we deserved it. So now is this something like uh, the opposite of the envelope of shame you've got in pandemic? <laughs> in a way, I, I, I don't want to give anything away on this envelope because that would right. be a spoiler. This is a sealed envelope no one can see. Right. So this is, this is as close I'll get to a spoiler. I would just suggest other people not open that envelope as early as we did. It didn't ruin anything. It didn't mess with anything. It didn't screw up our game. And we don't feel overly guilty for opening it. But I just think it's something you're better off waiting a little bit. Beating one hard mission after you've only played eight times is probably not justification of you feel you really deserve it. Small tip. It's not going to break anything if you choose to open it before that. But you may want to wait a bit. Well, so it seems like they've left it rather uh, vague. Uh is that perhaps uh, the, when they open it, is that perhaps to help out more inexperienced players who can open it sooner or make it maybe emotion, more emotionally rewarding if you, if you do hold off and, uh, and you know, get that boost closer I, to the end? I, I, again, I don't want to give away anything. So right. I, don't, I don't want to say anything. Fair enough. Because like I said, that, that's an envelope that they don't even tell you is in the box. So. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, a spo it's a spoiler that I'm even talking about the envelope, though pretty much everyone's seen it. If you buy a box insert, you're going to find this envelope. So, overall, thoughts on Gloomhaven so far, right? Uh, seven or eight games in. I can't remember if this was game eight or this was game seven. I remember when I clicked, there was a seven on Board Game Geek, but I can't remember if that was after I said I played or if it was <laughs> before I said I played. So, anyway, seven or eight. Um, this was the one Gloomhaven experience to me that actually almost or did live up to the hype, right? Everyone talking about this game for being fantastic. Like, it felt like something that deserved the number one spot. Like, any game that gets us to stand up and cheer at the end of the match, like at the end of the game and high five, like, come on, you got to give that props. It was really fun and rewarding. The puzzle is very neat in this particular mission. And solving it's not the right word, but dealing with the puzzle effectively was very rewarding. Now, what I worry is it was that fun that we'll be chasing the dragon for the rest of the campaign. You know, it, this puts me in a thought. I, I was wondering what it would be like to track or uh, the evolution of ratings on Board Game Geek, or if you were able to have a number of plays associated when you submitted your rating. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be interesting because I would be more likely to tempt someone who had submitted a rating at, that was linked to 20 plays of a game than someone mm -hmm. who, you know, played it once and rated it because they had a bad time and didn't like it. You know, if they if they played um, Fallout and they mm -hmm. they were that player who got that, that yes. one problem that got knocked out, they rated a mm -hmm. five because they hate it, um, even though they just got stuck with a, a bad piece of luck that particular time. Um, 
knowing knowing where someone's rating come from is valuable, but it's something that at this point there is no way to see on Board Game Geek. No, it would be nice if into when you mark you played a game, if you got to rate this session. That and would then be you handy. Could see yeah. a track of that, because what I think would be even more interesting. Because as Daniel Zaya said, uh, the, the problem with what you're saying is there's so many people play a game once and never play it again. Yeah. And that's becoming more and more popular. So it's going to really weight the players who play games a lot. And the players who play games a lot obviously like the game. So I think it's going to skew all of the games up. Because right. you're going to get more ratings from the people who played more. Because right. they like it or else they wouldn't be playing more. But I think it'd be way more interesting to see a history of ratings. Like if people rate Gloomhaven 10, but after their 10th play, it's only a 5. Yeah. Obviously, there's not enough. Like, Gloomhaven's probably a terrible example for that. <laughs> but, like, whatever. I can't think of a game that's that repetitive. Most of the games I own, I probably would still enjoy five games later. But I know there's games that, like, Time Stories, you can only play once. The first mission, once you play it, you're done. So if you played it second time, it's probably not going to be as fun. And by the time you're playing it five times, you're probably GMing. And what are your thoughts on it then? And I know there's games out there that just heck we'll bring up Candyland. maybe the first time you play Candyland, you think it's really neat and then you start realizing wait a minute i have no choices to make so you knock it down right yep i think that would be really cool to see the evolution and then i know the opposite is true right where you see people who are like uh a good example for me is cry havoc the first time i played cry havoc i was like yeah and then i tried it a second time I'm like oh wait and then by the time I played it the third time, I'm like, this is good. And I actually swore I was going to play that game 10 times this year because it was so good. And I managed to get in, I think, eight plays by March because I was really obsessed with that game at the time. But my first play, I played someone else's copy and I didn't even like it. Right. And then I think I got it for my birthday. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll play it again. Well, it would be interesting. Maybe maybe the uh, the best solution would be you keep the rating system as it is right now, exa- unchanged. And then add a secondary tracking rating system that that would exactly use the you know if you click to play you that you've played a game, it allows you to put in a rating and then you really can track that history and and movement of how a game rates over time and number of plays. Um, that would be that'd be interesting because I mean I'm sure that you know again again Fallout is a perfect example. Some game times you play yeah. it it's going to be a you know eight. Sometimes you play it it's going to be a mm-hmm. five um, because you just yeah. ended up with that wrong. Uh, set up oh i agree fallout was probably a nine or a ten the first time i played now i think i've got it rated at a seven right and i could potentially drop it to a six right like it's it's at that point right um it, it would be cool to know another thought going with this nothing to do with board game geek ratings but one of the things tom vassal who's been doing what we're doing here for way longer than we have um he does a look back and he does a look back every month at the games he reviewed last year, five years ago, and 10 years ago. And he'll always show if his rating's gone up or down. So that's how I've always found interesting. Now he's talking years have gone by. And in most cases, the old games, the rating goes down. And the new games, the ratings go up. But it does change. Like every now and then, it's like, oh, I rediscovered this game from 10 years ago. And I realized it's the inspiration for this, but it does it better. And I it used to have a 7. Now I gave it an 8. So it's cool to see that tracking. I noticed uh, you treat you uh, retweeted Isaac uh, Childress yesterday, mm-hmm. whose 2018 top ten list has zero games from his twenty seventeen top ten list yes. on it. Um, and Isaac Childress is the designer of Gloomhaven. Right. <laughs> You'd think that might make the list, but apparently not. Yeah, well, maybe it didn't come out in twenty eighteen. It came out in twenty seventeen. Right. So that could be why. Now, we record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games, who's finally joined us after some Adobe difficulties. Uh, tonight, we've got uh, Steve popping in. I think he's probably already cooking. And uh, Teldrin is there. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, I know... Uh, yeah, we lost some people. We had, we had a lot more viewers, and they disappeared. I'm not sure what happened there. Hopefully, it wasn't any issues with our video. Yeah. So I noticed Prayerborn was with us earlier, was talking to us. Steve D was with us. There was someone else that jumped in. It was a new name, and I they were the ones that pointed out that your video had died. Uh, no, late it was Teldrin. Oh, I didn't see Oh, it. late cold. Frozen completely. Oh, yeah, oh sorry. It's just after. Yeah. So I hope if there is something wrong with the video, if you don't mind, please let us know before you take off. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can figure out what's wrong and fix it. Or you just don't dig listening to two dudes talk <laughs> games. That's cool, too. Absolutely. Well, we are now past our 2000 download mark on the podcast. 
Thanks to everyone who subscribes and listens to the podcast who's made that happen. And for others, please take a minute, if you could, to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform, leave a like, thumbs up, or review so that it's easier for others to find us again. So the other day, I drew the winner for our Quiver giveaway. And if you give me a couple seconds, I will repeat the name. The name is at Zariel on Twitter. Zariel Elzwan is their full name going and it's at X-A-U-R-I-E-L. And what I thought was awesome is I got a hold of Quiver Time. They shipped their Quiver. And then Zariel actually sent a picture to us and tagged us showing him stuffing it full of his magic cards, which is pretty awesome. Yep. So within within one week, we uh, we he won, got it, and is already using it. And man, did we sell a lot of quivers over the holidays. Between quiver time and tabletop deals, we were kind of working back and forth, sharing each other's stuff. Sold a lot of quivers. They did really well. And uh, they let me in on a secret. They have something new coming in the new year. And I said, tell you what, send one to me, and I'll help you promote it. I don't even know what it is yet. I just know they have something new coming. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that in the new year. That, that's that's the bonus content. I don't even have that in the show notes. Uh, so I sent out a newsletter today. You also could receive that newsletter. I try to send them out on Wednesdays. Every now and then I get busy. It comes out on Thursdays, but I'm going to try to send one out once a week. This is just a recap of all the content we've released in the week previous. So the blog post, any new podcast episodes, if we do an unboxing, reviews, anything else we create, anything that's coming out under the tabletop bellhop, there's a list in there. Every now and then we throw a little bit of bonus content in there as well. We are above 50 subscribers, which is pretty awesome for a newsletter because those are people who obviously care about what we're doing and that is awesome that is a directed audience people who are saying yes please give me more thank you very much you can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar so i am throwing a new year's party and you are all invited every year i host a gaming in the new year party with some of my closest friends now, my house is not big enough for all of you, but I do welcome you to join us as we stream the entire thing live. You're at the regular place at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Now, this will be similar to what we tr did tried to do for our launch party. But since then, we have or I have made a lot of tech improvements to my home network. So I do not expect we will have the tech problems, jerkiness, robot movements and falling apart transformer like audio that we did last time. You should be able to expect the solid stream as good as we had at Extra Life. Now, we aren't going to go too crazy with multicam stream casting or anything like that, but we will try and have a solid video feed of what's happening at our main table. Uh, and we can interact with people who've dropped out by and are in the chat room. Yeah, last time we were able to pick up the audio from the room really good. So I don't know if we're going to have any featured games. There is a small chance and she games and I may be able to find some swag left over from Extra Life. And there's a chance we may just do some giveaways. So as for the actual time of the stream, all I can tell you right now, it'll be December 31st. It'll run until we shut the lights off sometime on January 1st. This usually ends up being pretty early in the morning. And except for the... As for the actual start time, I'm not sure. Um, I'm pretty sure we have it set up so people start showing up around 5 o'clock. But we'll see. We still got a little bit of time to plan for that, and we have time to tell you. So listen here, watch here for more info as the new year gets closer. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media also works really well. Um, I, I'm everywhere. We're everywhere. Uh, Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Uh, there aren't many sites I am not on. I do prefer if you send the questions through the website, though, because I make sure I don't miss them. It's really easy, especially on Twitter. I've had a couple questions come through on Twitter and people say, hey, what happened? And I'm like, I missed it, right? Like Twitter's like yelling into a thunderstorm. It can get missed. If you send it through the web page, I get a notification right away and it goes into a special folder. There's no way I'll miss it. So I do prefer that, but I'm not going to say no if you ask me a question anywhere. Today, you get a buy one, get four free episode. That's right. We're answering <laughs> four of your questions. Now, there's a reason for this slight change in format. I went six days without a PC, without my tower. 
Uh, nice. If you follow me online, you probably noticed I had been way quieter than usual. I've probably been way louder than usual today now that the system's back. Now, I haven't been silent, uh, but I have been quiet. And the reason for that is I've been trying to do absolutely everything on a Chromebook that's at, at least five years old, if not more. Now, Chromebooks are awesome. I know my kid's school runs on Google, both at the school and for homework, but blogging and Instagram and heavy social media use yeah. require a bit more planning and management as everything has to be cloud accessible on the right the right cloud and, and ready to go. Yeah, and you have to remember all your passwords because you don't have your system with LastPass on it. Yeah, there's lots of things. Uh, that Chromebook was old enough that if I open at least three tabs, it's starting to slow down. If I get five, it's almost ground to a halt. And it's just an internet box, right? Like there's, I didn't even have paint at one point. We're like, oh, I need to edit a photo. Oh, I don't even have paint. Um, that, and I didn't have access to all my blogging stuff, right? Like I have a blogging folder on my terabyte hard drive where I keep all like the logos, the images, Pictures I took, right? Like I couldn't share pictures of game nights when they're all at the shop. So what I did, I did what I could, um, but writing up a full ask the bellhop, do the research, answer a full question was kind of out of the question or at least out of my comfort zone with the tech I had. Trust me, I was, I was frustrated enough if I still had a pool in my backyard, the Chromebook might have been in it. This is another problem with these devices or, or, or any mobile device really. Um, the software advances, and you can't skip the updates because there are major security flaws being patched regularly. But those also come with the new features, and with that comes a need for more resources. And these devices just aren't upgradable. I mean, they're they're low-cost consumer no. electronics. Like it, again, as Sean said, I love the Chromebook. The Chromebook's awesome. Actually, at this point, I'm thinking of buying another one as a backup that hopefully can handle more than three Chrome tabs at a time. <laughs> but I got to admit, when I didn't get my PC back on Tuesday, I kind of panicked. I'm like, well, it's it's Tuesday. It's like noon. We have a podcast tomorrow. I didn't write a throwback Thursday. I didn't write an Ask the Bellhop. I'm like, I guess I could spend the whole episode talking about Gloomhaven. And NG Games even suggested that. She's like, we could just talk about legacy games. I'm like, yeah, but the point is to answer people's questions, and no one's asked me about legacy games. So if you want to ask about legacy games, feel free. Ask the Bellhop. Um, so I'm like, i got to answer something. So I thought about it for a bit, and I started going through uh, the list of questions. And speaking of questions, there is room on that list of questions. It's starting to shrink. That's questions at tabletopbellhop.com. That's right. Now, looking at the list, I saw a bunch of questions that have quick answers, right? Stuff that I'm like, I could have just replied to this on Twitter and probably did, actually, in some cases. Or it's something like, yeah, I can write about this. Like, these aren't simple questions, but stuff I don't need a full blog post or we don't need a full podcast episode to talk about. So I sat down at my Chromebook and started answering some of these questions and basically just started at the top of the list. So some of the questions here are some of the earliest we've ever received. Started working down the list until I'm like, yeah, okay, that looks long enough for a blog post and probably enough for an hour and a half podcast episode. So on to the first question. Uh, <laughs> our current format has us looking to spend about an hour and a half, give or take, as a finished podcast. And we don't want to come up short for our listeners. Now, Christopher Charo at Late Cold on Twitter asks, any idea if Zhang Guo is good at two players? Now there's Late Cold who was in our chat earlier. So now I feel bad they left. <laughs> Though they already got to read the podcast up or the, the blog post. They already know my answer. So Zhang Guo is a fantastic game. I honestly don't remember now if it's on my top 20 list of right now, but thinking about it right now, it belongs on my 20 top 20 list of right now. Uh, probably was. This is a game about the unification of China where players are working to develop a uh, standard language, set of currency, standardized currency and a standardized set of laws. And you're sending governors out into the provinces, of, I think five different provinces, you're building infrastructure and you're also working to build the Great Wall to defend against the Huns. So while the emperor has decided to unify the country of China, mm -hmm. the players, his emissaries, are the boots on the ground actually getting the work done. Making tough choices <laughs> with limited resources to get the most out of your region without angering the people. Yes, it's, it's actually a fantastic game for that the way it balances, because if you hire too many workers to build the wall, the people get upset and revolt starts to happen. Fantastic game from What's Your Game. It's on the heavier end. This is this is a 
gamers game. I hate saying gamers game because it sounds exclusionary. I don't mean it that way, but it's for people who enjoy longer, heavier games, which is not everyone and doesn't have to be everyone. Now, Zanguo is amazing with four players. I've even had a great time with three, but is it good with two? Well, the map is designed to work at all player counts, two to four. There's no problem with the map. You don't have to counter off areas or hide it or change anything, which is always really good. Now, a lot of the player interaction in Zhang Wo is trying to figure out what cards your opponents are going to play. Now, usually you don't need to figure out the exact number, but you're trying to figure out if they're going to play a high card, a, midi a middle card, or a, a low card. And that is going to determine what you're going to do and what cards you're going to play. So when you're playing three or four players, you've got a lot of people to read, right? Like you've got a lot more to take track of. So I actually think that aspect of the game is tighter and more cutthroat with two because you only have one other person to focus on. You're definitely going to be enjoying the hand management aspects just as much, if not more, at two-player uh, versus four. I agree. Now, the other big thing in the game, though, is area control and area majority, where you're trying to put your stuff out in the provinces, you're trying to get, build the great walls and everything else. Here's where three and four players really shines. Now, the problem when you go to two players, it's win or lose, right? It's black or white. It's you win or I win. There's no one coming in third or fourth. There's no one getting those smaller victory points. It's still give them something. This is take it or leave it. You get the spot or you don't. So two player does suffer there a bit, but I think only a bit. Overall, I would say that Zhang Wo is good two player, but it's great with more. And this is where the crowds at Board Game Geek really agree. This game shines with four players, but is not to be ignored for the two and three player counts if you don't have four to sit down with. That is exactly my opinion as well. On to the next question. Now, Emmett O'Brien over on G Plus asks, are there any good ways of printing off a larger format map, like a print-on-demand service? Well, of course, the, the basic way that everyone's been stuck with for many years is just somehow divide up your big image into pages, which is usually done pretty automatically by most paint programs, and then put them together on the table. Um, now, I know that's probably not what Emmett's looking for, but I do have to say this method does have a couple of advantages. One, you can do it from home. You don't have to go to Staples, order anything online, do anything. You, you well, Assuming you have a printer at home, which is not necessarily everyone does, but assuming you have a printer at home, you can do it. You probably have a printer at work you can use, whether you should or shouldn't. Um, the other thing, though, that I really like about using small pieces of paper is you can do a fog of war. So you can only put part of the map out, especially in an RPG game with like a dungeon. This is great. Whereas if you print a big six by six map, it's kind of there, right? Like, yeah, maybe you can cover up some of it, but if you print out individual sheets, even better, you can then possibly cut them out even into separate rooms or hallways and put them down as you use them. Yeah. So I actually personally am a bit of a fan of just sticking to the eight and a half by 11 paper. Yeah, you can really plan ahead uh, as you're laying it out before you do the print, actually even, to, to lay things out onto the, the way it's going to print out across the multiple pages and uh, try and get yourself... In a, set up in advance for your fog of war that way. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I do have a tip. Um, there is a piece of software called Posterizer or Poster Razor or something like that. Uh, it's, it's Poster Razor with only one R, one way to look at it. And it is specifically designed to take a large image and break it into eight and a half by 11 specific sheets. It's designed for taking a movie poster and being able to print it. Now, that's at PosterRazor, P-O-S-T-E-R-A-Z-O-R, dot SourceForge.net. Now, another option is uh, the longstanding BlockPosters.com, uh, where you don't even need to download any software. It's uh, You just go to the website, drop the page in there, drop your image in there, uh, and it will uh, break it up for you. Uh, Microsoft Paint, in its, uh, print, in its uh, print setup document, uh, lets you to say how many pages by how many pages you want it set up uh, you'd like to fit your image into on printing. So there's a lot of different ways to get in there uh, with various levels of quality and, and uh, features uh, over and above the basic split it up into X pages by Y pages. Yeah. I know one of the issues people have complained about, and I think Paint has this problem, is it puts a border where post razor supposedly bleeds right to the edge so you don't have to trim all your sheets of paper. But I don't, I, I'll have to also admit I haven't tried this piece of software. So it's just something I've found recommended by quite a few different people. So of course your next step is 
just getting it printed big, right? Um, so your standard office supply stores, Staples, Office Max, Office Depot, Monarch Office Supply, whatever you happen to have, uh, some of those are Canadian, some are US. Um, the thing you want to ask for is you are not looking to print large. You're not looking for a standard print. You're not just going to print on paper and copy at a certain size. You are specifically looking for large format engineering prints. Now, Sean and I were talking about this topic earlier today, and we were both on Staples. And I'm like, I can't find what you're seeing. He's like, oh, did you select engineering? It is definitely a thing. You want to make sure you're getting engineering prints. The price difference is surprising. Now, it's not huge, but it's there is a difference. Plus... Without the engineering prints, you can't get as big. Now, what I did notice, at least locally here in Windsor, because I had to select a store to do this, is the engineering prints had to be ordered in. They couldn't be ordered to pick up at the store the same day. The other thing is you probably want to stick to black and white when going to Staples, because as soon as you add color, the price does really huge. Now, everything I could find for Staples and Business Depot, I think is the other Canadian one, was the widest they would go is 36 inches or 3 feet. But I did see a lot of people online saying that FedEx office, which I assume is a U.S. chain, goes up to four feet wide. So now I do a lot of printing and layout for uh, construction documents. Uh, and one thing you really want to be sure of is, is thinking about your table size. Um, so mm. if you're going to be printing out something large, really pay attention to how much space you have on your table. Because, sure, you can print out something that's three feet by four feet. But if your table is only six feet by three feet you're going to run into some logistical problems with everyone trying to work at the table unless you have a separate map table or you're hanging it up on a whiteboard or, or something. You've got to think about dice, character sheets, snacks, drinks, or mm -hmm. whatever else might need to be at the table. Uh, but And yeah, so a Staples, the rough, rough estimate, you double your price if you go color uh, for the engineering yeah. prints. It's $6 for a, uh, a, four by, a, four by, or a three by four image and 12 if you want color. That's actually not that bad. I thought it'd be worse. So that, that's, that's better than I thought it would be. Yeah. So if you like the big maps, you're printing big, you figure you got enough room and you want something more durable, something that's not going to get ripped or if you spill a drink on it, it isn't going to be ruined instantly, you might want to consider checking out vinyl banners. Now, this is not what most people think of when they're thinking gaming maps. Like I'm talking about the banners you see if you go to any con that the people use to advertise, right? And you see them hanging outside places that haven't paid for like a neon sign yet, right? They hang these banners. They are surprisingly cheap, with cheap being a, a relative term, <laughs> cheaper than I would have thought advertising like that costs. So there is a company out there called Banners on the Cheap. And as far as we can tell, this is one of the cheapest out there. Uh, you can get a two by two banner for 10 bucks, but there's a lot of hidden fees with that and shipping's crazy. And as soon as you go up just one more foot, the prices greatly increase in size. You can do full color uh, at more cost. Uh, banners on the cheap is used by so many gamers that they have added an RPG map section on their web page, which is kind of neat to see. But we do recommend you do check other sites. Yeah, so that's bannersonthecheap.com, all one word, banners on the cheap. Uh, now, do be careful. Uh, banner is, banner printing is a uh, one of those markets where everyone is doing it now. There's a billion people doing it. So to try and differentiate themselves, people are, are trying a lot of different things. Uh, and I, I would describe most of these companies and most of their websites uh, as similar to GoDaddy, uh, where you've, they're, they're really going to try and upsell you or hide costs on you. So just be aware, uh, if you're, especially if you're, if you're just looking for one, a lot of them are, you're not going to get as good a deal. Um, I think for, for the $10 two by two, by the time I got it all the way to checkout, it was up to $25 for that, uh, to get to my door. Right. So just be aware. Now, what I would suggest is if two by foot by three foot is large enough for you and you want something not quite as low quality as a paper print, um, and you would like full color Costco photo printing or Walmart, um, are great. Uh, a two foot by three foot color image on photo paper is $14 here in Canada at Costco. Uh, and if you want something larger, canvas prints are another option. Uh, again, you get that photo quality and you get some, some durability and long term. Uh, they do cost a little bit more, but they're sort of, uh, you know, somewhere you might not below vinyl, but better than your photo paper. Cool. Uh, so just be aware that uh, whatever you're doing, 
you know, you're going to be looking to do some research on this. Uh, unfortunately, we can offer a couple of suggestions, but yep. uh, depending on where you are and shipping and the day of the week and how long you wait for an email, uh, <laughs> your prices are going to vary a lot. Yeah, as, as I know, banners on the cheap. When I wrote the blog post, that 2x2 two two vinyl banner was $5. When we went to do the research for today's episode and Sean was looking at it, he got a hold of me and he's like, where do you see a $5 banner? And I looked and it's gone because they had some kind of 40% off free shipping deal yesterday that now is 20% off everything. There is a bonus tip and I don't know how many sites this had worked on, but this morning while getting ready for this episode and checking out pricing, I made a banner and then I checked out everything, but I didn't pay. I just left. Well, about four hours later, I got an email saying, come back. We'll give you everything in your cart plus 30% off if you complete your order now. So that might be a nice trick to get a further discount. I don't know if it's going to work everywhere, but it seems to work on banners on the cheap. So now something even higher end than banners, uh, higher end both price and quality, you could look at neoprene mats. Now these are the, the mouse pad mats, right? You see card players, Magic the Gathering players have been using these for years uh, so their cards don't get dirty on the tables and so they're easy to pick up. Board games are starting to ship with them, right? Like um, Rising Sun, there was a way to get a neoprene mat. You can buy a great big one for Firefly. They are getting more and more common. Legendary, uh, the Legendary Encounters games all come with mats instead of boards. Now, these are fantastic for card mats or player surfaces that are going to get a lot of use and really need to last. Mm -hmm. For your average map, this is probably overkill, unless it's maybe your home city where you're basing all your adventures out of for an RPG. Yeah, the other place I was thinking it'd probably be useful, if you're doing a con game, especially if you're going to run the same game over and over, if you're running, I don't know what, whatever con, and you've got, you know, the Caves of Chaos, and you're going to run the Caves of Chaos, uh, which is Keep on the Borderlands, you know, three times at Gary Con this weekend, and then you're going to plan on running it at Origins, and you're going to run it somewhere else, that's probably a good case study for doing a neoprene mat. Because again, the nice thing about that is if anything gets spilled on it, they can be cleaned. Not necessarily perfectly, but it's definitely going to survive better than paper. Uh, now, there are a lot of sites out there. You can get whatever you want printed on a mat. Uh, there's Cow Cow and Arts Cow. Why, why are all the print-on-demand sites cows? I don't know. There's something, cow spots. I don't know. Um, but there are sites specifically for printing gaming mats. Uh, one of the ones that I know locals have used for X-Wing stuff is a company called Deep Cut Studio. Uh, that's uh, deepcutstudio, one word, dot com, slash printomat. P-R-I-N-T-O-M-A-T. Now, another one I've seen that's really well-reviewed is Inked Gaming, I-N-K-E-D, gaming.com. And I know they not they don't only help edit for a price, but their mats are machine washable. Uh, so, you know, if you've got snackers and uh, things, <laughs> easy to clean up. That's cool. Actually, I get, I subscribe to their newsletter and I get stuff from Inked Gaming. They had a lot of sales for uh, Boxing Day and the holidays. But I didn't realize they did mats. I knew they did some other stuff. I thought they were more of a, a prototyping company, right? Like if you were trying to prototype your game, you'd get a hold of them. Right. But I hadn't thought about, yeah, just getting a mat. That's a cool idea. So now uh, the one part of the thing I skipped, well, technically, I guess designing your own mat is print on demand. But Emmett specifically said, is there a map print on demand company? And surprising to me is, yes, there is. Uh, they're called Gamer Print Shop, and they're exactly what he's looking for. Uh, they do print-on-demand maps up to uh, three by four feet. They offer cardstock or paper. You can even get it on um, thicker uh, foam core, and you can even pay to get it laminated. So I thought it was pretty cool. I did not check pricing. I'm guessing it's probably not cheap, but who knows? And then another much higher end solution would be the Geekify service for cloth, cloth RPG maps that you can even get them to age for you. Wow. Um, we're going to put a link in the in the show notes and on the way because it's a little yeah. bit too re too big to to read out. But uh, yeah, so they do cloth maps. They will uh, tear the edges for you and eight and like do tea staining to age it. So if you really want, wow. you know, a, a sort of a, a keepsake type map, um, and so they're not they're not cheap, but they aren't as expensive as I would have expected uh, for the quality you can get. Interesting. I've seen a lot of nice cloth maps as Kickstarter rewards. So they'll put out like some big module, right? And they're like, we'll give you a map of the Forgotten Realms on Clap. On Clap? I don't even know what I was just trying to say. <laughs> what does that mean? They will give... 
I don't know what just happened. Uh, I'm still speaking English, so I don't think it was a stroke. It was just one word. It wasn't a whole string of nonsense. They will give you a full-size map on cloth. Um, and I've seen some great ones. Like I've seen pictures of Ernie Gygax holding up like these big cloth maps and showing them off. And I'm like, it, it seems to be a popular Kickstarter reward. And I, I wonder if they're using this Geekify ink to get them printed or doing it their own. So there are a lot of options for printing things out there uh, with a lot of different price points and use cases. You really need to look at what your specific needs are, what your price point is, and whenever possible, you want to try and get your hands on samples. Uh, don't be afraid to call up these companies and say, look, I'm trying to do this. What, uh, you know, can you send me some of your materials? Can you send samples? Is there somewhere local I can go that, you know, carries your product where I can get samples? Because again, everyone's going to offer something similar, but uh, there, there's going to be quality differences in there. And you, you really need to watch yourself uh, if you want something that's really going to last a long time. Or if you're looking for something with just a one-off, you know, cheap and dirty works. All right, what do we got next? Uh, so NecroDaddy80 asked during one of our Twitch live streams, is Concordia the best game ever made? <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry it's not. Um, it's a fantastic game. It really is. It combines a ton of individual game mechanics, like a crazy amount. Like our game mechanic list, it's like you roll 2d10 times on that list. It's crazy. You got card drafting. You've got deck building. You've got action selection. You have resource management. You have hand management. You've got point-to-point -point movement. You've got a self-adjusting economic market. You've got area control, area majority, set collection, even some engine building. Like, it amazes me that Concordia is able to mash all this together, and it makes it work beautifully. It's the sushi effect of, of board games, except I actually like all those individual mechanics. So not quite the sushi effect. It's the sushi effect if it was sushi made of um, double cheese, pepperoni, and Italian sausage. Well, an excellent game. It's on the heavier side and generally considered an expert mm -hmm. game. Um, oh, I, would yeah. that, I would say that for a game to be considered the best ever, it should should <laughs> strike fear into the hearts of a casual gamer. Uh, it may yeah, not be exactly. it may not be easy to play for them, but they shouldn't be terrified of trying <laughs> to sit down and and make it work. And and I feel like yeah. this one's leaning on that side. Yeah, I agree. I, I have worse games, but it's it's intimidating, especially putting it on the map and putting everything out, laying out and putting all the counters, giving everyone their market, and there's all the, all these wooden bits. It, it's a lot, and like it's definitely not for everyone in any way. Um, for one, it is literally the most boring, most overused board game theme ever, which is trading in the Mediterranean. There are more trading in the Mediterranean games out there than there are variants of Yahtzee. I think the only game that gets a beat is variants on Monopoly. Definitely beats out trading in the Mediterranean. But other than that, if you're going to Euro games and gamers games, there are so many games about this region and trading resources to try to get points. Um, plus, it has a really opaque scoring system, and that's coming from someone who plays a lot of games. Like, it's so opaque they actually tell you the first time you play, once you get to this point in the game and stop and do a mid-game scoring, just to make sure everyone gets it before the end of the game comes and someone's surprised. Now, even doing that, every time I have taught this game, there's someone who did not get it. Even at the end, they're surprised. They're like, what? No, I, I, that's why? Oh, geez. Like, I think this takes two to three games to really get what's going on for someone who plays a lot of games. And if you didn't like the theme, there is Concordia Venus, if you'd like to uh, have a, have your trading somewhere else. Uh, from what I understand, Concordia Venus is actually going to make it a co-op game, which sounds very interesting, or maybe team-based. I'm looking forward to that, actually. Um, there's also Concordia Salsa, which just makes the game more complicated. Uh, but all this said, I love Concordia. Uh, I don't remember if it was on my top 20, but again, if I remade that list right now, I'm like, Zango and Concordia, let's go downstairs and play. And I'm thinking I might have them out on the table for New Year's because, man, these are good games I would like to play again. So I do dig Concordia, but no, it's not the best game ever made. And I got to admit, I don't think there is a best game ever made because to me, the best game ever made would have to be everyone would dig it. And I got to admit, the closest I can think of right now has got to be close to Azul because it's the one game that I could sit down and play Charles and have a good time, or I can sit and play with my mom, or I can sit and play with Little G. 
And I don't know many games I can do that with. And I'm still not going to say that Azul is the best game ever made, but it's probably the closest I own. So what do we got last? All right. Number so uh, Galdel 1960 on Twitter writes, that's G-O-L-D-E-L 1960 on Twitter writes, question for the bellhop. Marco Polo or Coimbra or Lorenzo, you can pick one. There can be only one. Godel 1960 now makes me think he's a Cardassian. Something about the way you pronounce that. There are four lights. There are four questions. Uh, I got to say one thing. Starting this, it's rare. It used to be rare that someone would mention a game and I'd be like, wow, I no, sorry, I can't help you. I've never played that. Um, it was even more rare, almost impossible for someone to mention three games that I'm like, no, no sorry, man. I haven't tried them. Well, in this case, there's three games. Haven't done it. Uh, but you know what? Nowadays, I, I don't even think it's that rare for, say, Tom Vassell to be able to say the same thing. I got to say, there, there's just too many games. It's insane. Like, we knew there was 3,500 last year that came out. And then when Daniel was on, he said it was 8,000 this year. Like, that's insane. Like, you just you can't keep up. Yeah, I, like, I've given up. I'm not even trying to be called to the new anymore. Like, uh, there's no way I'm going to play all the games. I got enough games downstairs. Now, it's not saying I won't buy anything new, but... I'm, I'm no longer interested in trying to chase the, the new hotness constantly. And now, well, like I said, the 8,000 number does include, uh, thankfully, include expansions. So we aren't, it, it's not quite as bad as still, it. it's still horrible. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Now, this is one of the ways we strive to be different here at the Tabletop Bellhop. We don't know every game. We haven't played every game. And we aren't here to hype the latest and greatest Although we do occasionally lean a bit heavily on the old and hard to acquire. Yeah, it's not intentional. <laughs> the games we talk about here span a wide range, but are talked about generally after multiple plays or in the week in review over, over multiple plays so that you can see a deeper look and get a deeper understanding about what is right for your gaming table. Yeah, I just want to let people know about the games I like and why, or if I'm not enjoying a game, why? Uh, it was something that came up in the feedback earlier today, and so far everything's been positive. I haven't had anyone come on and say, I don't know what they'd say, which would be the opposite of that, but hey, we want to hear more about games you hate or something. I don't know, whatever. But yeah, I'm going to talk about the games I love. The problem is a lot of those are older games that I still enjoy and still play, and some of those are out of print. So we do apologize whenever we send you on a wild goose chase trying to get some rare out of print game. Just remember Vassal's Law. If a game is good enough, it will be reprinted. Do not spend your life savings trying to get a game. There are far too many games out there. If it's your number one game, you must have it. Just settle for the one under it and hope that number one comes back sometime. Like I'm, I'm always blown away when people spend ridiculous amounts of money on some game that will probably just get reprinted at some point. Yes, there are exceptions. There are, you know, a few games that will never come back. But you know what? Dark Towers coming back next year. Like that's one people have been saying for years you'll never see again, and it's coming back. Fireball Island reprinted this year, right? Vassal's Law is, is uh, the man's been doing this way longer than most of us, and knows what he's talking about. So now going back to the question, right? Uh, was it Marco Polo, Coimbra, or Lorenzo? Which I'm guessing it's Voyage of Marco Polo and Lorenzo El Magnifico are the full names of the games. Uh, Coimbra, just Coimbra. I do have an answer. So if I had to pick between these three, I'm going with Coimbra. And that goes back to Origins just this past year in Columbus, Ohio. That game was hot there. Everyone was talking about it. The booth was packed. I walked by and I'm like, ooh, that looks cool. And it reminded me of Madeira, which is a, a game I really like, a dice-based uh, resource management game, which is what this looks like. And I just, I couldn't get a demo game. It looked neat, but I didn't want to wait in line. Like, I know, yes, if I really want to try a game, wait in line, I'll get to try it. And I probably wouldn't have to wait that long. But it's Origins, it's busy, and it's big, and there's lots of other stuff to do and see. Plus, as we just said, there's lots of games that came out. I don't necessarily have to try this one right now. It looked cool. So the dice system in this one really sort of catches the eye and, and is, it seems to be its really major selling point. And it, I must note, it comes with a reasonably well-designed insert uh, from the manufacturer and it looks like it needs it because there's a lot of bits and bobs on that one. Yeah, this is, an, this is another heavier game, right? Like this is another, there's a lot going on as far as I can tell. I don't know much into it. I, I didn't do a lot of research, but I kept hearing good things. So I listened to a lot of podcasts. I read a lot of social media. I follow a lot of uh, board game media people. And I see this game come up a lot. Um, 
So that jumps to the top of the list. Now, the other games I've also heard good things on about. Uh, Lorenzo would be number two for me, especially based on the board game geek rating. Like, it's rated above Coinbra. So right there, I'm like, huh, if Coinbra is supposed to be so good and people are rating Lorenzo better. Plus, the theme sounds really neat. And I got to say, Marco Polo is kind of off my radar. Like, I've, I've heard of it. I've seen some good reviews. I don't know why. I, like, I couldn't even tell you why I haven't paid much attention to that. Probably because there's 3,500 other games trying to fight for my attention, and that one kind of flew under the radar. So number one Coimbra there's my answer final answer uh, for what I can tell I was doing a little bit of research on this yesterday and uh, Lorenzo Il Magnifico becomes even better when you add in the Houses of Renaissance expansion okay so keep in mind if you're looking for that uh, you might want to go that way as for Marco Polo as you mentioned I think we're talking about the 2015 yeah. Voyages of Marco Polo because the Voyages. other various games that go by that name <laughs> are mm, Less exciting because we're we're staying yeah. positive about games. Um, mm -hmm. They they do really again the Agents of Venice expansion on Marco Polo uh, really seems to sort of take it up to that next level and add a, a new dynamic. Uh, and it's actually I think two separate sort of in one box uh, expansions. Okay. Um, and looked really uh, like an interesting way to go with the game uh, once you'd uh, gotten into the if you if you like the original game. I will admit what I'd rather have is Netflix bring another season of Marco Polo back than pick up that game right now because I really dug that show. So that's it. That was one, two, three, four. If I've been counting correctly, we are out of questions. Hopefully uh, those satisfactorily answered the questions you guys asked. Well, this was a great talk. Be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Click on gaming advice for other questions yes. answered in blog form. Be sure to send us your questions. Uh, we mentioned it a couple times. Go to the website. Click Ask the Bellhop. Email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or you can send Mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Hit us up, social media, and all that stuff. Uh, we do give a slight bonus to our patrons at the Good Tip level. That's only two bucks, less than a cup of coffee. Uh, if you send us a question, you back us at two bucks once a month. We'll bump that question up to the top. Now, speaking of a Patreon, a shout out. And a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Yep. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8.45 Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. No heads up, that time may be changing as uh, there have been some employment changes with the boys. Yeah, they may be starting earlier. That's what we've heard last. Uh, but we'll, show, we'll be sure to let you know, though I'm sure if you're already a fan of the show, you're already paying attention. It is a great show. One of, one of my favorite podcasts to listen to and what I do every Tuesday night on Twitch is watch and join in their chat room. Absolutely. Brian Kurtz, who you will also see over at Misdirected Mark, thank you for backing our show. Duran, Duran Barnett, thank you very much. Joe Swick, your Instagram and your, what is it, uh, Swarm. I saw you were in Frankenmuth. Man, I love Frankenmuth. I need to go back to Frankenmuth. I hope you had a good time. Absolutely. A great place to visit, uh, especially this time of year, although yeah. the weather, and the weather is actually, I guess, better. You don't have to deal with the snow, although the, the snow is part of the, the fun there as well. So, you know, you, yeah, you, lose that Christmassy, you lose that Christmassy feel. Steve D., thank you as always. I hope your uh, dinner is going well. Jeff Seuss, thank you. And a welcome to our latest patron, William Fisher. Thank you very much, William, for supporting our efforts. Oh, that was the double bell. That means this shift is done, and I'm going to have to lock the front doors. So move along, move along. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Now, if you like the content we're providing and you would like to support our efforts, consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We'd like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off the books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.